Uh, let me uh, begin by uh, telling you a little bit about my mother. Um, some of you have met her, or you've seen her. Uh, I have several nicknames for my mum, and one of them is the Nosy Gazette. Uh, it probably doesn't need too much explanation, but I will explain, in that she wants to know everything about, about me and what I'm up to. Uh, she has softened over the years, but there have been times where I'd go on holiday or away for a few days, and she just wants to know everything. Who was there? Do I know them? What did you get up to? <laughs> Um, and I was like, Mum, you could really have made it as a journalist with your inquisitive questions. And um, so, on the one hand, uh, my mother can be a little bit annoying, um, but she also makes me laugh. And uh, to put it on the flip side, if there is anyone who knows, there is no one more, there's no one who knows the foods I like and the way I like them more than my mum. And if I'm sick, the first person I'm going to is my mum. Uh, and maybe this experience echoes those of you day to day and that, yes, mums can be a bit embarrassing, yes, mums can be a bit annoying, but where would we be without them? Uh, but I'm also conscious that maybe that's not everyone's experience. It could be that you don't have a particularly good relationship with your mum, uh, or you've lost your mum recently. Um, and Mother's Day may be especially difficult because you long to be a mum, but you've not yet had that opportunity. So I just want to acknowledge that and um, to, no, to say, to, to encourage you that, that God knows that and he has a special grace for you today. And as we look at a particular story in the Old Testament, a particular mother, uh, there will be much that is specifically for the, the mothers and ladies amongst us, but I hope that there is also something for all of us to take away today. So if you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to Two Kings chapter 4, and the story that I'll be reading fits in nicely with our ongoing journey through the book of the Bible, uh, the, the books of the Bible, and she's known as the Shunammite woman, and I will read from it shortly, so it's 2 Kings of chapter 4, verses 8 to 37, but before I do, a little bit of a uh, background to this passage, show the book of Kings, Matt touched upon it in the last week as he looked at King Saul, and David, uh, it covers the period from Solomon's ascension right to, through to the exile. And this covers a period of about 400 years. And the book of Kings, in many ways, was written to tell those in exile what had gone on during this period and effectively why they ended up in exile. There were some good moments, but there was a lot of bad stuff. And that contributed effectively why uh, the Israelites um, ended up in exile. But this period was also a golden age for prophets, Elijah, Elisha, and then also those whose writings we were perhaps familiar with, uh, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and the minor prophets. And that's why as we come to the major and minor prophets later on in our studies, it's important to read them through the lens of what we've read in Kings, because they all join together. So, uh, let's have a read. Um, I'd like to read the story because I think it is, it's helpful to provide that overall perspective and um, that will then enable me to just draw some points of reference and application for us. So, 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning from verse 8. One day, Elisha went to Shunem, and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So, whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. And she said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes our way as a holy man of God. Let us make a small room on the roof and put it in a bed, put in it a bed and a table, a chair and a lamp for him. Then he could stay there whenever he comes to us. And one day when Elisha came, he went up to his room and lay down there. And he said to his servant Gehazi, call the Shunammite. So he called her and she stood before him. And Elisha said to him, tell her, you have gone to all this trouble for us. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? She replied, I have, I have a home among my own people. What can be done for her, Elisha asked. And Gehazi said, well, she has no son and her husband is old. <coughs> then Elisha said, call her. So he called her and she stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. No, my lord, she objected. Don't mislead your servant, O man of God. But the woman became pregnant. 
And next year, about the same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha had said. And the child grew, and one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers. My head, my head, he said to his father. And his father told his servant, carry him to his mother. After the servant lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and went out. She called her husband and said, please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. Why go to him today, he asked. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. It's all right, she said. So she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, lead on, don't slow down for, unless, unless I, for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to the servant, Kihazi, Look, there's the Shunammite. Run to meet her and ask, Are you all right? Is the, your husband all right? Is your child all right? Everything is all right, she said. When she reached the man of God on the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Kihazi came over to push her away, but the man of God said, Leave her alone. She is in bitter distress, but the Lord has hidden it from me, and he has, he has not told me why. Did I ask you for a son, my lord, she said. Didn't I tell you, don't raise my hopes? Elisha said to Gehazi, tuck your cloak into your belt. Take my staff in your hand and run. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed him. And Gehazi went on ahead and laid on laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him, the boy has not awakened. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay upon the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As he stretched himself out upon him, the boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room and then got up onto the bed and stretched, stretched out upon him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. And he said, and he did. When she came, he said, Take your son. She came and fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. So, what a story, right? Um, I mean, it's probably one that many of you are familiar with and the first thing I'd like to say from this story is that the Shunammite woman was a mother before she was a mother. The Shunammite woman was a mother before she was a mother. At the beginning of this passage, we can see that this woman is keeping an eye on Elisha, welcomes him into her home, and then this develops so that whenever Elisha's in the region, he and his servant just stop by for some rest and recuperation. And for Elisha, it's not long, he's not long into his solo ministry. His hero in the faith, his mentor Elijah, is not long passed away. There is a lot on his shoulders. And maybe he's not always looking up for himself. But the Shunammite woman was. Provided food for, her, for him provided a shelter for him. And the room that he was given in their house is known as, I hope I pronounced this right, as the Aliyah, A-L-I-Y-A-H. And it was the most desirable spot in the home. So this was gener generous hospitality on the behalf, on behalf of, on, on, yeah, by the, by the woman and her elderly husband. She was a motherly figure to Elisha at a time when he was just beginning his ministry. And as he served Israel, he was able to stop off at this place, a place of rest and recuperation. And clearly this ministry had a huge impact upon him because he was like, how can I bless you? And when it came later on in the story, when uh, this woman's son is, has died, he drops everything to go to her. And if it meant so much to him, by consequence, it had a big impact upon the whole nation. Because her ministry, her faithful ministry, 
enabled him to focus his attention upon the people of Israel. And I want to take this opportunity to commend those in our church who take a motherly care for those that are biologically theirs. And they are, there are people in this congregation that do that. They keep an eye on them, they provide food for them or just make sure they're doing okay. They take an, a keen interest in them, perhaps welcome them into their, your home. Someone, a uh, family did this for me many years ago. I was at Bible College my final year. I was up in Chester for six months. And there was a family there called the Clarksons. A lovely family and they welcomed me in. And the mother, Angela, especially took care of me. She would take me here, there and everywhere. She quickly got familiar with the, the things I liked. They invited me on family uh, do's and things like that. And it just made me feel a part of their family. And Angela especially, she always was just making sure that I was okay. And it meant that I could focus on my studies, I could focus on my ministry in that church. And I know that my parents were hugely grateful that they were able to step up for the plate for, in, in, in their absence. And so I want to encourage those here that look out for those that said biologically aren't yours. You keep an eye on them, you've got that motherly touch, you're a spiritual mum to them perhaps. And look at the impact that the Shunammite woman had on Elisha and know that your ministry is incredibly important and significant and that God is using it in ways that you cannot see. But if I may add an invitation and exhortation to this as well, how can you continue doing that? How can you expand that ministry. And perhaps is God putting on your heart this ministry, that there are people in your midst who need a motherly touch? Is God calling you to be that person? And know what an important ministry that is. Second point I'd like to make is that the Shunammite woman expressed doubt but fought with faith. The Shunammite woman expressed doubt but fought with faith. Not long after she begins nursing her dear son, he passes away. And the text indicates that she let no one in on the fact that her son had passed away. She simply says, everything's okay. And she goes on her way to, to, to Elisha. If she, there wasn't any faith there, she would have stayed still. She wouldn't have gone and make a beeline for, for Elisha. But she says, all is well. And then she's going on her journey and Elisha spots her and Elisha sends out a servant to say, look, go and see if everything's okay. So Gehazi goes and says, is your husband okay? Are you okay? Is your son okay? Everything is all right. And then she meets Elisha. And then something Different happens. Now Elisha, he's the prophet to Israel. God has let him in on some big secrets to do with the whole nation. But for this woman, God is saying nothing. Why is that? Why is not why has he not let Elisha in on what is going on here? Well the clue is in the fact that the scripture tells us that she was in bitter distress. And I think that the reason why God did not let Elisha in of what was going on, because he wanted the woman to express her grief, to express her distress, her questions, her doubts. Go back to the beginning of the story. She's, she's fearful when Elijah said, Elijah says, look, you're going to have a child. She's like, she says, don't say that. What was if it doesn't come true? And so all of these questions emerge again when her son dies these many years later. And she is in bitter distress. So she's holding on to faith, but there is doubt. Philip Yancey, the Christian author, says this, Doubt always coexists with faith, but in the presence of certainty, who would need faith at all? Doubt always coexists with faith, for in the presence of certainty, who would need faith at all? And we see this played out in the passage before us. That God, that, that, that she was in distress, there were questions, there were doubts, amidst this fight for faith. And God was saying, it's okay to let her out. 
It's okay to express your questions, your distress, your doubts, your grief. There's a lovely verse in Psalm 62, I think it is, which says, Pour out your hearts to God, for he is our refuge. And you think about Thomas. He's known as Doubts and Thomas. But God, Jesus had so much grace for him. What other disciple that we know of got to touch the wounds of Jesus? And he had this beautiful story, this beautiful testimony, this beautiful experience, because he expressed his doubt. And, and I wonder if there's anyone here today, and particularly the mothers amongst us, that you're, you're praying for your children, you're, you're fighting for your children, but you're not seeing much go on. And perhaps there's just some lingering doubts, there's some questions, there's some grief there. And this passage is, let this passage be an encouragement to, to let that out to God, to know that he receives your tears, he receives your questions, your distress, your doubts. There's healing in that. There's freedom in that. And that is why I, feel, I believe that God did not let Elisha in on what was going on. So let it out to God. Or find someone that you can trust. Let out what's going on in your heart. Sometimes, particularly mothers, parents can feel like they've got to keep it in for those around them. But also because maybe they want to feel like they've got to please God. They don't want to let that God down. But God's saying, no, let it out. Pour out your hearts to me. I am your refuge. It's okay. There is a season for questions. There's a season for expressing doubt. But also note that doubt isn't the, the end of the story here. Because not long after this, we see this mother fighting again. She resumes her fight. She says to um, uh, Elisha, Surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So Elisha, he was clearly going to have lots of other stuff going on, but she, this woman is saying, look, you're coming back with me. She's fighting again for her son. And it's, this, is, this, was, this we see throughout this passage. She's fighting for her son with faith. And it's her faith that in, in ultimately ends up, her faith in God in, and in the power of God through Elisha, that results in her son being raised from the dead. And as I was thinking about this passage and what God really wanted like, to convey today, because we look through the story, you know, someone's been raised from the dead, and that rarely happens now. I'm not saying that God won't and cannot do that today, but let's be honest, it, it, it rarely happens. And then we see the tactics used by Elisha, and we're not going to get away with that in this day and age. <laughs> You know, it's just not possible. These are, I mean, this is an unusual story, but there are key things that we can take from it. And I've strongly felt the Lord, that the Lord is wanting to say, particularly to the mothers and the fathers here, to step up your fight for your children. I don't know whether you've been so discouraged and you've let that go a little bit because you're not seeing much go on or you're just going complacent. I don't know where you're at. But I think that's what God is saying today. Step up your faith, your, your, the fight in faith, through prayer, intercession, through your witness. Step it up. Because as we do that, we have, it's an invitation to God's power, our work in our lives, in and through us, and in the lives of your dear children and those under your care. He is waiting to respond. He is waiting to work. And that may take a long time. But this story is a reminder that as we fight in faith, God responds. God responds. So let faith arise afresh. Let hope arise afresh. Let fight arise afresh. <clears throat> uh, you may have heard of the... Uh, the great Chinese missionary James Hudson Taylor and he had a remarkable ministry in China and he grew up with a tremendous passion for the gospel and for prayer and a lot of it can be put down to his mum. Uh, when he was 15 years old 
he was uh, rummaging through his father's library and he came across some gospel tracts and he liked the stories in the gospel tracts but he didn't like the sermon bits the the lesson bits so he's like i'm going to read through the stories but i'm not going to i'm going to ignore the rest of it and this is what he then set, wrote down i sat down to read the little book in an utterly unconcerned state of mind believing indeed at the time that if there were any salvation it was not for me and with a distinct intention to put away the trap as soon as it should seem appropriate. Little did I know at the time what was going on in the heart of my dear mother, 70 or 80 miles away. She rose from the dinner table that afternoon with an intense yearning for the conversion of her boy and feeling that absent from home and having more leisure than she could otherwise secure, a special opportunity was afforded her of pleading with God on my behalf. She went to her room and turned the key in the door, resolved not to leave that spot until her prayers were answered. Hour after hour did that dear mother plead for me, until at length she could pray no longer, but was constrained to praise God for that which his spirit taught her had already been accomplished, the conversion of her only son. The young James Hudson Taylor, he went reading through the tracks and he had an encounter with the Lord. In that moment, on that day, he gave his life to Jesus. And then he carries on and says this. Several days elapsed, and I ventured to make my beloved sister the confidant of my joy, and then only after she had promised not to tell anyone of my soul secret. When our dear mother came home a fortnight later, I was the first to meet her at the door and to tell her I had such glad news to give. I can always feel that dear mother's arms around my neck as she pressed me to her bosom and said, I know my boy, I have been rejoicing for a fortnight in the glad tidings you have to tell me. Why, I ask in surprise, has Amelia broken her promise as his sister? She said she would tell no one. My dear mother assured me that it was not from any human source that she had learned the tidings and went on to tell the little incident mentioned above. You will agree with me that it would be strange indeed if I were not a believer in the power of prayer. Isn't that a lovely story? So I don't know what fighting looks like for you, whether that's stepping up in prayer, intercessions, it's, it's that witness. I don't know what it is, but if I can encourage you to ask God and say, look, how, what are you ask, how are you asking me to step up my fight with faith for my children? For those in my care. And one final point, and this is for the rest of us. See, the Shunammite woman needed others to fight for her as she fought for herself. The Shunammite woman needed others to fight for her as she fought for her son. Elisha, she, she, he was so overwhelmed by the ministry of this woman that, that, that she asked through her, through her, through his servant, what could be done for her? And initially she said nothing. But Gehazi, his servant, was observant and noticed that she grieved that she, she wasn't a mother. And so he shares this with Elisha, and a year later, she gives birth to a boy. And then later on, she's in distress, she comes fighting with faith, but with those doubts, and Elisha and his servant, they drop everything, and they go. And there's three things to bring from this. Elisha and his servant, they ask what they could do to help. They observe what could be done. Because often, there's stuff going on behind the words, right? And we need to think, what's going on? What can we see? So they're asking, they're observing, and then they went. They acted. And so for the rest of us, for those who have mothers in our lives, that ladies in our lives, how can we fight for them? What can we ask them in terms of the help that we can give? What can we observe? Where can we notice that they're struggling or that there's some things there we, that we need to delve in deeper? And then what can we do? Elisha and Gehazi were significant in this, this journey that we see here. The Shunammite woman needed them. And similarly, the women, the mothers in our church need the rest of us to step up because God has given them a unique role and he wants us to fight for them.